Hey guys, welcome to the show today. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, we have a really fun and exciting replay episode from a year and a half ago or more. And so because so many of you are newer listeners to the show over the last year, you may have missed this excellent conversation and wide ranging conversation on the culture of death with me and one of my earthly heroes, Pastor Jack Hibbs. And it occurred to me that this would be an excellent episode to play again right after my ninth White Rose Resistance National Live Church Tour stop at Calvary Chapel Chino Hills this last Sunday and the Sunday directly following the elections in California enshrining child sacrifice through point of birth into the state constitution and protecting it as a quote-unquote sacrosanct right. And with the Senate moving today to try to ramrod through their Respect for Marriage Act or Gay Marriage Act which is just the political tool to continue the next iteration of the secular progressive moral revolution and its eugenics obsession of labeling their political dissidents as undesirables, unwanted, and unfit to live. Oh, the same words they used to describe the preborn baby. Exactly, right? Because if you're like a Gideon and you contend for the rights of family and children, you're thrown out into the secular progressives' utter darkness, where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Well, in 2021, Pastor Jack and I were at Heritage Church in Escalon, California, discussing the ERA, the Equality Rights Amendment, or the Equality Act, which has been a decades-long pipe dream of secular progressive activists that aimed to accomplish much of the same things that this Respect for Marriage Act, which is a euphemism for castigating and uh, targeting political dissidents, in other words, Christians and conservatives who believe what the vast majority of Americans in all of human history have believed about marriage forever <laughs> as the threat to, quote unquote, democracy. Jack and I talked about all this at the time and how this fits into the larger culture of death and its sacrament of abortion. As we said then, so is true now. If the church wakes up in California and starts mobilizing and sending good news out of California, then maybe it's not too late. So buckle up and enjoy this long-form conversation with Pastor Jack Hibbs and I at Heritage Church in Escalon from 2021. Lord bless. <laughs> guys. Thank you. Um, so what we're going to do, here's the plan for the evening. Um, uh, Seth is going to open in a song. Uh, we still good with that? Did we, did we talk about that? Yeah, we, that right? Yes. Uh, I'm just going to ask the guys uh, a couple of questions, maybe for the next 30 minutes or so. I just want to direct the conversation a little bit um, because I think there are some good talking points that I think I'll probably ask on a lot of people's behalf. And then after 40 minutes or so, we're going to turn it over to you all for some Q&A. We're going to have some microphones down the back. So you can look forward to that. You can be thinking about your questions. And like I said, anything that you want to ask this evening, um, re relative to what, re relevant to what we're talking about, obviously. Um, <laughs> and I, I assume that we are all going to have some good judgment as to what's appropriate to say on the microphone front of everybody, uh, but you'll be able to ask those questions this evening. Okay, so I wanted to start off, uh, maybe Pastor Jack, I wanted to ask you uh, this. W other than being a pastor and a Christian, that's probably your primary motivator, but why is the abortion issue such a personal issue for you? Yeah, it became a personal issue for me when I discovered in my junior year football practice, we were doing Two a days, if any of you guys remember two a days, the opening of the season practice. I came home and I did what anybody did in my generation at that time. I was eating, eating lunch and sitting in front of the TV watching Sea Hunt. Anybody remember that? Yes. <laughs> and my mom somehow did not equate or think that next, next room over I could hear the conversation she was having with a neighbor. And she was telling the neighbor about how when she became pregnant uh, with me in San Diego, that my dad had told her he's being uh, repositioned re or redeployed in the US Marines to Alaska. 
He had his oldest son. He had his oldest daughter. A third child was not to be in the scene. So he had told my mom, when I get back in a year from Alaska, I don't want a third kid in this house. You do whatever you need to do, but I don't want a third baby in this home. And so uh, I'm listening to my mom tell the story to the neighbor. When you're that age, you're resilient. You don't know. You don't care about anything like that. And so uh, she had uh, proceeded, terrified, scared. She proceeded in late term, by the way, to have an abortion. It was December 24th, 1957, where she put my brother and my sister to bed, and then she attempted uh, an abortion in, in the kitchen uh, of the home in San Diego. Thank God that failed. She wound up going to the hospital, Sharps Memorial Hospital. They stitched her up. We laid there together until January 15th, 1958, I came into the world. I heard that as a teenager. It didn't matter to me at all until I got saved. When, when I found out that God had a plan for my life, everything began to fall together for me. And uh, it's passionate for me. It's funny, Morgan mentioned the rapture and abortion. Uh, because I believe in an imminent rapture, it makes me passionate about pro-life. Does that make sense? I want to save as many boys and girls as possible before the Lord comes back. And uh, you say, well, what if it takes 100 years? Then that's all the more time. Well, what if he comes back tomorrow? Well, it means I get caught doing my father's business, Amen. right? And so that's important to me. And then we have, we have a granddaughter who was here this morning. She's back home now in um, SoCal, who now she's 10 years old, but when she came into our lives, she was actually in the womb of her teenage mom, or very young 20-year-old 20, 20 mother, standing off the five free, uh, 15 freeway near Barstow with two little baby boys in hand. She was gonna go get an abortion. To make a long story short, that little baby girl was born into our family, and we have uh, now a wonderful 10-year-old that was rescued from the grips of abortion. So for us, it's, yeah. it's an ultimate uh, topic. That's what happens when you, yeah, that's it. It's a, great, it's a great thing to ponder that if Pastor Jack's mom had been successful, mm -hmm. look at the impact Pastor Jack has had on his country and the people around him. Look at the plan that God had for the unborn. And uh, that's a real picture of what we're taking away from someone when we mm. abort a baby. Now, Seth, uh, you're relatively young. You're, a, you're still a pup. Yeah, you probably look up to me like a father. Uh, Basically. Um, <laughs> how, did you, how did you end up on You're this? You're 30, right? Was around that, give or take 15 years or so. Um, how did you end up in, in this call, in this lane, in this ministry? I mentioned this morning your mom, but just kind of help us understand why you are where you're at in your yeah. call. Yeah, I, I mean, I, <clears throat> I say that I've been swimming in these waters for a long time. And I mean that quite literally. I was literally swimming in fetal water as a fetal pro-life activist. Um, so I actually mean that quite literally. Uh, because my mother was actually directing a pregnancy care clinic, pregnancy resource center, in Azusa, California. It was actually really close to AP. It was called Living Alternatives at the time, and I think they've changed the name since. But she actually became the director of that clinic, I think at like 27, or 26 or something like that. And she stepped down when she had me. And my mom actually passed in, um, in 2015. Um, to cancer, but we were pulling out some of her things and boxes in the house one evening, and we actually found the Living Alternatives Pregnancy Resource Center a bulletin announcement saying, uh, Diana Gruber is stepping down as the director of Living Alternatives to welcome her new son, Seth Gruber. Um, and so my mother was literally housing pregnant women who didn't have anywhere to, to turn or to live. Um, she was babysitting the toddlers of the children of the mothers who chose life but still didn't have the male figure in the picture to support, and she would babysit these kids to give the mom sort of a brief break. Yeah. Um, and so I, I've, yeah, quite literally been swimming in these waters for a long time. And then I grew up doing the Walk for Life for our local pregnancy care clinic in Whittier, California, where I grew up, going door to door, asking people to sponsor me to walk <laughs> for the local clinic. Um, so that's sort of just the brief genesis of, of my story. Mm. Well, okay, let's get into a couple of questions here. So first of all, uh, this is for both of you, but uh, maybe Pastor Jack, you go first. Throughout the history of mankind, since the beginning of time, 
um, child sacrifice has always been this immoral fixture in our society. Why is that? Why has the killing of babies, innocent babies, always been a part of human uh, culture? You know, it's amazing about your question is the fact that um, you said it's a, it was an immoral practice. It's, in the beginning, it was only immoral to God. If you think about it, there was no Judeo-Christian rule, in, in, a, in a sense, given among people. Paganism ruled the day. Abraham was brought out of the Ur of the Chaldees, a pagan-worshipping, child-sacrificing world. It wasn't until God gave his word that man was now ultimately responsible. It has always been part of human culture. So the first thing we need to do about this topic today is recognize that it's intrinsic to the depravity of man. You just need to realize that. Sacrificing human babies is what man does without God. Yep. It's just, it's just the way that it is. And what's interesting about that is no matter who you are, no matter, you may be here tonight and, you're, and God has touched your heart and thank God and God, you, you said it beautifully, both of you said it beautifully this morning, God can redeem and heal. Absolutely and he does. Just remember this, that without God present in our thinking, people die. Yep. And it's always been since the beginning of time. And... Um, it's a manifestation of our depravity. And you're gonna hold that view or you will defend that view for others because the society is lost. The, so, the society is without Christ. So it's argumentation from the beginning is, is askew, it's wrong, it's rooted in paganism. And, and that, you might say, as a Christian, boy, that's really, that's judgmental. It's not judgmental at all. This is the, this is the warfare that we are in. Yeah. We are in the battle of human souls yeah. in life. Yeah, that's right. You know, <clears throat> Satan has always been behind the killing of babies. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and this is something the church and pastors need to wake up to. Um, abortion is child sacrifice because Satan doesn't care the name of the God that you sacrificed your children to. He's happy to go by mm -hmm. any name. So he was happy to go by Moloch mm -hmm. at one point mm -hmm. as the Israelites were syncretizing their faith and prostituting their faith to Canaanite bronze little dudes and statues and worshiping them, sometimes building them larger and then building furnaces under their hands That's right. to heat yeah. up their hands and place their human infants on their hands. I mean, this is literally Child sacrifice, and if you want to know how God feels about abortion, it's exactly how he feels about child sacrifice in the Old Testament. That's you know, great. people say, oh, Seth, the Bible doesn't talk about abortion. There's not a verse that says thou shalt not abort. Um, and we can get into that later, but the point is it's child sacrifice. It's how he feels about that. God takes child sacrifice very seriously. In fact, you mm. will find some of the most colorful language from God's mm -hmm. lips, from God's mouth in scripture regarding his people's complicity with child sacrifice. And that complicity was actually twofold, right, Jack? It was complicity through allowing it, and it was complicity in partaking in it. Yeah. And in the Old Testament, God literally says to his people that if you allow one of your people to give one of his children over to Moloch, I will turn my face from you, cut you off from among the people. Hmm. I mean, that's gnarly language. If you allow it to happen, he wasn't saying, oh, if you do it yourself. He says, if you, as a priest, if you, as a man of God, allow this, I'm going to cut you off from the people. That's sobering language. So there's only one God, right? Yahweh. So any other God is not actually a God, right? It's a manifestation of Satan. Mm. So Satan was happy to go by the name of Moloch in the Old Testament. Guess what names he's happy to go to by today? Convenience, education, money, and career well-being. As long as you continue to shove children down his throat, he will be satisfied. Satan would kill God if he could, but he can't. So he kills babies because he knows it wounds the heart of the Father. Yeah. Yeah. And it hurts the church. And it hurts our witness for allowing this in yeah. our country. Satan was behind the killing of babies in Egypt. Mm -hmm. He was behind the killing of babies in order to eradicate Jesus. And he's behind the killing of babies today. It's the same Some thing. things never change. Yeah. Unfortunately, one of the things that never changes is seemingly God's people's silence in allowing this type of baby butchery. You know, if I might insert this, what if, everybody, what if God begins to move in California 
which frankly, you should get excited about God moving in California because out of all the 50 states, the history of California has more of God movements. You need to look at your history in this state. It's epic when it comes to glorifying God. You need to remember that. What if God moves in California again? What if he's on the brink now of moving again? Mm-hmm. Praise God. You, you, this church will be on the forefront of what he's going to do. And you know this, that God won't move until we denounce the things that he denounces. Mm. And if we stand for the things that he stands for, then what if California, the state that people have written off, what if California becomes a state in, in, in revival and a state that shows the rest of the nation because there's big, good stuff happening here. Mm. And uh, as you've been hearing this morning, I think as Pastor Morgan said, you can play a great role in yeah. that, but there's hope. Amen. As long as conversations like this take place. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, you know the hope. saying, you've heard this, right? What, stays in, what happens in California doesn't stay in California. And mm-hmm. uh, unfortunately, um, that is, that's sort of an, it's almost axiomatic at this point. But you know, th- that is true for evil, but you know what? It's also true for righteousness. That's right. And, and I believe mm-hmm. that what starts in California and sp- has spread to the country for evil can also do so for righteousness. If God's people in our church who worship an unborn child will wake up and start mm-hmm. in Yep. Okay. I-, I think what would be useful at this time, I know it would be for me and maybe people are more squared away on this than I am, but Seth, when we talk about having an abortion, what does that mean? Like, what does that look like? Because my mind goes straight to some surgical procedure, but maybe I don't want to reduce it down to something less than what it actually is. Yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> we've, been, we've been performing some pretty grisly um, abortions. Uh, some of them have now been made illegal. But... Um, I like to focus on really grisly abortions because they tend to wake people up more, but the point is, is that it's the same child. So as some of you are thinking like partial birth abortions and dismemberment abortions and how gruesome these procedures are, and they really are because they're more grisly to our eyes and to our mind, but I just, I just want to make this comment because we tend to have a more visceral reaction to late-term abortions, so sometimes we tend to think that that's more mm-hmm. horrific somehow just because it looks more like us and it's more bloody. But be careful in that type of thinking because mm-hmm. every abortion is just as wrong. So the child who's killed by an abortion pill at five weeks or four weeks right after mom finds out she's pregnant is just as immoral and just as evil and wrong as the child in the ninth month. Right. Um, but we just have a more visceral reaction to later term abortion. So I just kind of want to make that comment because I've noticed that in pro-life circles. They're like, oh my gosh, late term abortions? And then they're like, yeah, but you know, the abortion pill, maybe we should just allow that. It's like, ooh, careful. Like you're, you're, you're allowing the ideology of the enemy to take over, which is that not all children are equally valuable. But over 90% of abortions, actually almost exactly 90% of abortions are performed in the first trimester, okay? This would be the first three months, right? The first uh, 12 weeks. And it's the trimester in which there's the greatest public support for abortion because it doesn't look as human as us mm-hmm. or whatever that means. So the first type of abortions that would be performed the earliest would be the abortion pill. Um, Maybe I'll dive into this more if we have more time. Um, There's a lot to say about it, but the abortion pill um, hit the US market, I believe in 2000, Clinton brought it here. Um, And it has a very, very troubling sort of history. Uh, Sort of the Chinese Communist Party produces some of the drugs for it. Um, The same people who developed the gas to gas Jews also developed the chemicals in the abortion pill. So there's a really disgusting history behind the abortion pill. Shocker! Um, So you can look into that, and Live Action has a really great investigative report on the history of the abortion pill. I have a podcast episode called Cancel the Abortion Pill, because it has racist roots, and I've been told we have to tear down everything that reminds us of systemic racism. But the abortion pill (laughs) is taken through 10 weeks, and and our governor here, by the way, last year, actually in 2019, um, decided that it was very, very important for college-age women at four-year California state universities to be able to get the abortion pill in their university health center. Um, so this is going to lead to millions of more murdered children, and actually it's probably some dead women, certainly wounded women who are suffering from blood loss because the abortion pill is very dangerous mm-hmm. for women. Um, and so Newsom actually brought that here against the recommendation, ready, of Jerry Brown. That's true who had actually vetoed the bill that was trying to put the abortion pill in California for your state universities while he was governor, and he said, this is too radical. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah. So if, if a piece of pro-abortion legislation is too radical for Jerry Brown, we have problems in this state. Um, so Gavin Newsom ignored all of that advice and, and pushed it through. Yep. So very dangerous for women on college age campuses. The abortion pill is a two-regimen pill. The first one um, cuts off the hormone progesterone. That's necessary to maintain the lining of the uterus, the nutrients to the child. So essentially the baby starves to starves. death. Okay? Um, 24 to 48 hours or 36 hours later, you take um, misoprostol. And what that's going to do is it's going to force your uterus to have contractions. Now, you're not going to have this abortion at Planned Parenthood. You're going to have it on your toilet. Um, not because I say so, but because Planned Parenthood says so. They tell you, literally, um, don't look and flush. Okay? Now, the FDA has had certain um, risk evaluation and mitigation strategy requirements on the sale of the abortion pill. And it, it wasn't even to protect the child. I mean, we need to get the abortion pill out of this country because it murders babies. But it was actually done in order to protect the health of women. And there were two reasons for this. They required women to get the abortion pill in an in-person evaluation because you had to rule out ectopic pregnancies. Ectopic pregnancies is when the baby implants in the fallopian tube. Mm -hmm. So if left untreated, the fallopian tube expands, bursts, and mom and baby die. Mm -hmm. If you don't have an in-person evaluation to perform an ultrasound before you get the abortion pill, how will you know if mom has an ectopic pregnancy? You won't. So you will have some college women in California who are probably going to die on their college campus or be rushed to a hospital because Gavin Newsom decided that we needed to put it in university health centers without an in-person evaluation and an ultrasound beforehand. The second reason is many women misdate the gestational age of their baby. And, and many of you probably know this. Uh, a good friend of mine, Dr. Brent Bowles, we just did a podcast episode together. He's one of the foremost pro-life OBGYNs in the country. And um, he said that he would see, in, in seeing about 40 to 50 clients at one time as an OBGYN, he said that he had about 45% of his client, of his, you know, his patients, pregnant women, were anywhere from one to six weeks off of what they mm -hmm. thought their gestational age was. Mm -hmm. So what happens when a woman thinks that she's nine weeks, right, and the abortion pill's taken through 10 weeks, but she's really 12? and she takes the abortion pill, what happens? Well, that can lead to incomplete abortions. Usually a successful murder of the child, it just means you have dead baby body parts floating around in your uterus, making you susceptible to sepsis and death. So this is why the FDA has had these safety regulations on the sale of the abortion pill and why they've never allowed it to be telemedicine, meaning shipping it to your daughter's mailboxes on their college campuses. We've never allowed that. Even pro-abortion FDA under pro-abortion administrations have kept these safety regulations in place on the sale of the abortion pill. Well, what did COVID do? Well, here became the argument, hey, you stupid Republicans. You know, if you really care about the health of women, do you know what you actually have to do? You actually have to support us in removing the safety regulations on the sale of the abortion pill because one woman in an in-person evaluation with one physician who are both wearing magically protective masks, that's actually going to kill her because she'll breathe in COVID. So we actually have to get rid of the safety regulations in order to protect women. It was, and then, the, of course, abortion incentivized groups sued the FDA, and a uh, federal judge by the name of Theodore Huang ended up ruling that they couldn't enforce these. The Supreme Court ended up saying you can enforce them. But who packs the FDA? The presidential administration. So it's very unlikely that these safety regulations will be kept in place under a Biden-Harris administration. Absolutely. So that, I know that was a lot, but most people don't know anything about the abortion pill and how it works, so you just kind of need to know all that. But we poison babies to death, and we compromise women's health. And we do that happily, according to the abortion industry, all to increase access to abortion. After 10 weeks, you're talking surgical abortions um, or aspiration vacuum abortions. So if you've seen Unplanned, you're just sucking babies into vacuums. Um, after about 12 to 14 weeks, you can't really suck the baby into a vacuum anymore. So now you're talking about forceps, you're talking about dismembering limbs, you're talking about ripping them off one by one. And then you're talking about rearranging the baby on the table in front of you because you can't leave dead baby body parts floating around in mom's uterus, okay? Now, if you're moving past there, um, this is what used to be called partial birth abortions. And this is when you deliver a baby by its legs, while its legs and buttocks are flailing around, expecting the warmth of their mother. And then you stick uh, scissors into the back of the baby's head that's still in the mom's vaginal canal. You open those scissors to create a hole in the back of the neck right here. And then you stick a vacuum suction, or suction catheter tube and you suck the brains out so the cavity collapses so you can get it out of mom's birth canal. Um, now, those are illegal now, but not thanks to Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who actually attempted in two different Supreme Court decisions to protect partial birth abortions. Mm, right. Those are illegal at the federal level, um, but there are, you know, there are just other ways to kill babies in the late trimester without delivering their feet first. Um, so 90% of abortions happen in the first trimester. The other 10% would be second and third trimester. And in the third trimester, it's about 1.5%. It's about, uh, but you're still talking about 13,000 to 15,000 babies murdered in the third trimester every year in America. So those are the different ways that we kill babies in America. Um, so.
Well, can I add this? A uh, little bit of sunshine, just kidding, <laughs> to what he just said. Um, the current administration is 100% in support of what he, what he just talked about. They're, right. they're all for that. And don't be fooled, friends. You might say, no, no, but Joe Biden is a Catholic and pro-life. It's funny, the Catholic Church is denouncing Joe Biden. Yeah, won't give this, him communion. Won't give him communion because of his position. Oh. However, when you look at the policies of what Seth just articulated, uh, this is exact, if, if there wasn't a four year interruption to this agenda, you gotta remember, roll back the, your memory to four years ago, five years ago. Everything that he talked about was on track and being implemented and it was interrupted by, by a freakish election in 2016, which I believe was the hand of God, no matter what you think of Trump, it was the hand of God to save babies' lives because he, was, he turned out to be the most pro-life, the, pro, the most pro-life legislative executive in recent American history, if ever. Having said that, and this is all I'll say on it, is that uh, the decisions that this new administration will be making has nothing to do with Joe Biden, his Catholicism, or the lack thereof. This is actually policy-wise, literally the policy-wise of a third-term uh, Obama administration. It's Obama. Obama's the president right now. That's why, that, that's why Biden is just there. Yeah. And so how can you say that? Because it's passion to implement where it lifts where it left off with the abortion issue yeah. is picking right up yeah. where he That's left right. off. That's right. Do not forget what was happening at the end of the Obama administration. Exactly. Okay, we, we, were, we were trying to jail undercover journalists for exposing Planned Parenthood selling dead baby body parts on the black market not too far from here. We were trying to force California pro-life pregnancy centers to advertise for abortions on the walls of their clinics. That's like telling PETA you have to put up a sign and an ad for the local yeah. butchery. Ridiculous. And we were trying to force nuns, nuns, to pay for contraceptives, nuns who don't have sex, <laughs> to pay for contraceptives in their healthcare plans, which could include some abortion-inducing drugs, okay? And, and uh, Xavier Becerra yep. um, is, is a nun hater and a baby hater if there ever was one. Uh, he was the one trying to require California pro-life pregnancy centers to to advertise for abortions and to force nuns. You might not know this. After the Supreme Court ruled in favor of the Little Sisters of the Poor, saying no, they don't have to pay for contraceptives and abortion-inducing drugs in their health care plans, Xavier Becerra sued the federal government, specifically in regards to the nuns. <laughs> okay, so this was all happening at the end of the Obama era. That, those are some gnarly threats to the pro-life movement yeah. and the legislative attempts of the pro-life movement, which do result in lives saved. You guys have to remember what he just said. Uh, it was that very uh, ruling that, uh, you remember the US Supreme Court stepped in to defend the Green family who owns Hobby Lobby. And the US Supreme Court ruled in favor of Hobby Lobby. Hobby Lobby's argument was, wait a minute, we are a Christian organization and we are not gonna provide uh, funding for elective abortions for our employees because it's diametrically opposed to our Christian faith. The US Supreme Court in Washington, D.C. ruled in favor of Hobby Lobby. That became the rule, the law of the land, right? And so we thought, you know, we took a deep breath and dodged a bullet there. But at our church in Chino Hills, we got a letter, and that letter was from uh, California uh, Department of Health and Human Services and also uh, the statement made by the California Secretary of State, uh, or I'm sorry, the Attorney uh, General of California declaring that the governor and the, the Department of Health considers the Supreme Court ruling to be unconstitutional. <laughs> I'm not kidding. We have the letter in our office to this day. Here's the reason why. When the, when the uh, when the office came in to tell me about that, I said, we're not gonna, we're not gonna do that. We're not gonna pay, we're not gonna, we're not gonna be a church that will pay insurance to our employees and part of that coverage is for elective abortions. And so uh, what happened was Kaiser 
We, we offered our employees Kaiser and Blue Cross or Blue Shield. What is it? Blue Shield. Blue Shield. Um, that's what we offered them. Well, California required that both of those, all health uh, insurance, provide that, that option, that benefit. We refused. So we wound up filing a lawsuit against the state of California. We sued the state of California. We're still in that lawsuit, by the way. They just drug it out all these years. Uh, but here's what happened. We wound up losing our health care coverage at our church for all of our employees, which turned out to be a huge blessing, by the way, honestly. I'm not kidding. We wound up going down the uh, completely route, saved us over $300,000 a year. But yeah, I got to tell you something. Uh, we, we're still standing. I have two attorneys from ADF that still work on this case. And why? Because it was being forced down our throats four years ago. So listen, you want to talk about, well, we don't get involved in politics. You are already involved yeah. in yeah. politics. Right. Because when the politicians have no conscience, and they don't, the Christian community is supposed to be the conscience of a nation. That's right. And when we don't speak up about our con conscious and convictions of Scripture, That's right. then they're going to do what they're going to do. Don't be surprised. That's what they do when they're unfettered. Yep. It's supposed to be we the people, but I think we've surrendered that. But that is the reality. That's right. You cannot parse and say, well, we do church on Sunday. Yep. No, you come to church on Sunday to get fueled up to do yep. war yep. six days a week. Yep, that's right. Well, I've, <clears throat> I've lost control of this. Uh, <laughs> I have all these questions on my iPad. I was under the illusion that I was going to work through them. Um, <laughs> good. Uh, Pastor Jack, you're going to have to answer this one delicately uh, or with a lot of caveats, but can a Christian uh, be a pro-choice? Can they vote for a pro-choice? A Christian can be pro-choice if they are honestly ignorant of the facts. Oh, come on. Right. Okay? <laughs> but you should only be ignorant of the facts for a very short period of time. Amen. Because right. if you read your Bible as a Christian, Christians read Bible, yep. the Holy Spirit's going to change your worldview really quick. That's so right. you can be... You know, and I'm, I'm almost saying this in a joking manner because I firmly believe this, that the moment you become a Christian, the Holy Spirit will even teach you things instantly that you didn't even know. And notice how, God, how good God was to you when you were taught things by the Holy Spirit as a new believer before you even read them in the Bible. That's right. And then when you read it, you went, oh my goodness, yeah. that's right, he told me this six months ago. That's right. So only for a moment, that's right. it would have to be an ignorance, but God's kids, he illuminates you. Yeah, amen. So... I understand your question. Can you be a full-blown Christian today running around and saying, well, I'm, I'm, I'm a Christian and I, I believe in a woman's right to choose? No. And don't say that you believe in a woman's right to choose because you don't believe that. You really don't. Don't anybody tell you that. No, no, I believe in a woman's right to choose. Not really because the woman, listen, let's be honest. I'm going to be very blunt. Is it just us in here right now? <laughs> Let's pretend there is no God. We're pure evolutionists. Okay, let's pretend. We know as evolutionists that when a male meets a female, pregnancy takes place. So if, if a male and a female do not want to have a child, okay, they think of something else to do. <laughs> because science happens. Are you hearing me? Science happens. And so, when we say, oh, I believe in a woman's right to choose, of course we do. The choice, listen, is on a linear scale. At this point, you make a decision. For example, he flirts with her. She flirts back. He makes an advancement. She knows what's going on, right? He's made his decision. He made that before he even met her. <laughs> She makes her decision, her choice. The result of science and biology and chemistry is a baby. I believe in a woman's right to choose. What I don't believe is a woman's right to choose after the science has been implemented. That's right. Think about it. 
then I'll, I'll add to you, Morgan, on this, on this question. Listen, the prenatal God, the fetal God is not going to allow his children in his flock to remain pro-choice. That's right. And if you claim that you can continue remaining pro-choice, worse yet, defending it and celebrating it while worshiping an unborn child who entered human history in a womb that he once knit together, then you are <laughs> serving a different God. Because that God would not allow you to maintain that position yep. if you're in his flock. Yeah. So yep. yeah, sure, out of ignorance you can be, mm -hmm. but if you maintain and hold that position across time and space as a Christian, you should be trembling. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so one of the, the, I think the big uh, abortion elephant in the room situations is uh, rape or incest uh, or severe uh, health threats to the mom or the baby. Uh, Seth, uh, what? So the easy ones. Yeah. <laughs> so I think we understand the complexity of that and there's a bit of empathy that we ponder it. What is our biblical perspective on that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I'll, I'll give my one-liner yeah. so that you guys have something to remember because you're not going to remember everything, right? So I want to give you a little, like, you know, just philosophical firepower. So here's the one-liner, and then I'll explain it. Okay, you don't get to kill Timmy because Daddy did something wrong. Okay, that's the one-liner. You don't get to kill children for the crimes of their father. That is, that is evil. That is debased. That is demonic. Mm -hmm. And we wouldn't accept the killing of children conceived in rape if those children were already born. And here, here's a tactic you can use for people in your life. Some of them, by the way, who say they're pro-life, they'll say this, but they'll say, except for the cases of rape. I talk to these people all oh, the time, yeah. right? Ask them this. Okay, so, you know, we really don't want the baby to look like the rapist, right? Because it's gonna remind mom of that rape. It'll be traumatic for her, for that baby to look like the rapist. So here, here's what we'll do. Okay, listen, I, I get it. So uh, let me be empathetic too. Let's just let all babies conceived in rape be born. Just in case they end up looking like mom. Because if they look like mom, then mom won't be reminded of the traumatic experience that she was forced to go through by a disgusting animal. So that way, we won't abort any babies that look like mom. So we'll just allow all babies conceived in rape to be born. And they, but you know, facial structure takes a little bit to uh, you know, come about. Some people said my son looked like my wife and then me. So we got to give the baby like a year. And then in a year, we'll see if that baby looks like rapist or mother, and if it looks like rapist, we'll just chop its head off or throw it out the window. Because I'm compassionate, I'm empathetic, and I don't want mom to be reminded of the horrific experience she had to go through. So dang it, believe me when I say I'm compassionate. So that's what we'll do. So here's the point, no pro-choicer supports killing babies conceived in rape after they're born. Mm -hmm. I haven't met a single one, except maybe Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Kamala Harris and every, nearly every Senate Democrat who voted against the anti-infanticide bill. But anyways, <laughs> but they're all for killing babies conceived in rape in the womb. So what's the difference between the baby, because it's the same baby, and the baby was conceived in rape, it just moved six inches. Oh yeah, that's the difference, six inches through a birth canal. So I guess the fetus fairy flies up and sprinkles magical personhood conferring fairy dust on the child as it exits the birth canal, such that you reject mistreating the rape baby when it's born, but you're perfectly okay with mistreating rape baby when it's in the womb. Um, and so this is, this is what I call fetal bigotry. There is uh, another word for it, it's called abortion distortion. There's a distortion that enters our minds when the word abortion is said. When the word abortion is said, all type of moral reasoning goes out the window. <laughs> Haven't you experienced this in conversations? Like, whoa, the abortion distortion, because the same type of moral laws that we would apply to children outside the womb, we don't to children in the, inside the womb. So we've got to get back to that question, what is the unborn? And the science is clear who they are. They're a distinct living and whole human being from the moment of conception. Secondly, you can ask someone who uses the rape objection to justify abortion, say, cool, awesome, so you're fine joining me in fighting against the 99% of all other abortions that don't happen because of rape, right? And they go, no, way. Oh, no, 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 I support a woman's right to choose. Oh, so why are you hiding behind rape victims to make yourself look compassionate? It's evil. Yeah. They're using them as a human shield to disguise their fetal bigotry. So they don't really support abortions in the cases of rape. They support it in every circumstance, and they're using rape victims as human shields. Lastly, abortion and rape are wrong for the same reasons. Rape is wrong because it is violence against an innocent human being without proper justification. Why is abortion wrong? Violence against an innocent human being without proper justification. So they're wrong for the same reasons, and we need to say it that way. I would just add, I would just add, to, is this dead? can you hear me? I would just add, allow the child to live, 
Let the child be adopted. Your conscience will be free as a mother. You won't have to worry about it. The baby lives. Baby has life. Yeah. And you talk about birth defects and things like this. There are situations where you mentioned a moment ago where the, where the, the, the pregnancy is going to be in such a case or the... the uh, Oh, yeah. the fallopian... Ectopic it? pregnancies. In that, the could kill, that could yeah. kill the mom. Mm-hmm. I understand that. Abs- yeah, yeah that, that's, that's those rare events, but they do happen, but they're rare events. Yeah. But... Um, and let me actually jump on that. Let the baby be adopted. For, yes. for life of the mother, because that was the second one Morgan brought up, so let me finish it. I know I, I uh, take forever to make a point. Listen, for life of the mother, you need to be aware of this because this, this is probably the most successful propaganda mm-hmm. um, ideological manipulation that has ever happened in the minds of the American public strictly on the issue of abortion. Because virtually every pro-lifer I know, who isn't like in the pro-life movement, you know what I mean? Because if you're in the pro-life movement, you're aware of these conversations. But every pro-lifer I've met who's just like, you know, default pro-life, they all say, except for life of the mother. And so the assumption is, is that abortion is necessary to save the life of the mother in a high-risk pregnancy. I, I have some news for you guys, it's not. Because in a high-risk pregnancy, the threat to the mother's life is the pregnancy. So question, is abortion the only way to end pregnancy? Mm. No, childbirth. Inducing early labor, performing a cesarean section. And you can actually go to the Dublin Declaration. I can't remember if it's .com or .org, okay? But the Dublin Declaration, go Google this, over 11 or 1,200 signatures from OBGYNs, neonatologists, doctors, medical students, and embryologists all saying that you do not have to kill the baby. You do not have to perform a direct abortion Mm. in order to save mom's life. And it's actually less dangerous or more safe to induce early labor or to perform a cesarean session than an abortion. Shocker. Yes, because abortion involves forceps inserted up the birth canal where you try not to rip through the uterine wall. Of course that's more dangerous. So even in high-risk pregnancies, you don't have to directly perform an abortion. Now, someone says, yeah, Seth, but what about ectopic pregnancies? It's like, that's the one you just said. What about ectopic pregnancies? Also not an abortion. There's two different surgical procedural names for the surgery that's performed to remove the baby from the fallopian tube or to remove the entire fallopian tube if you can't remove the baby that's in the fallopian tube. They're called a salpingectomy or a salpingostomy. Now, I don't expect you to remember that, but my point is, is they're not called an abortion, notice. Why? What is the definition of an abortion? The intentional, the intentional killing of the unborn child. Are we intentionally killing the child when we perform a salpingectomy to remove the baby from the fallopian tube? What are we intentionally doing? Saving the life of the mother. Mm -hmm. And how many lives do we lose if we don't do that? Mm -hmm. Two. When the the fallopian tube ruptures and bursts, mom and baby die. So it's better to act to save one life than refuse to act and lose two lives, but it's not an abortion. Morgan, let me affirm that you've lost total control of this. <laughs> um, you know, I want to I share as a pastor what he just said causes... Uh, listen, in, in, in the foyer of our church, or in the courtyard, after services, I meet young couples all the time, all the time, who say... Pastor, please pray for us. Um, we were so excited. We're pregnant. And we went to the doctor. I hear this all the time. And the doctor said that there could be, looks like there's some troubles. And they have, they have suggested abortion. Well, how far along are you? Uh, four months. Every, my counsel's the same every time. I wish I could parade these people in front of you right now. The joy of pregnancy has been tainted by a doctor who said, you know what, we just don't, something doesn't seem right here. We've taken, we've looked, and now the, now the mother's worried, sick, doesn't enjoy her pregnancy at all, and then, but I get the joy because this is my counsel to them. Let God be God. Let God be God. Don't listen to your doctor. Find a new doctor. Get out of there. Don't do, that, that doctor's dangerous to your baby's health and yours. That's listen, right. Guess what I'm holding at church nine months later? They come up. I'm telling you, this doesn't happen once a month. This happens often where they'll say, look, this is the baby that the doctor said. We have. Look, perfect baby. Wow. Okay? And then because of that, listen, oh, Timothy, guard what, was com- guard, guard what is committed to your trust. Avoid profane and idle babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called science. 
Oh, we've seen, we, sh- we think you should abort the baby. Do you know what I've concluded? It's a miracle what's going on. Nobody understands it. It's more vast than the, than the universes that we can observe. Yeah. Okay? It's more amazing. But now we have the technology to look around in there. We have technology that's greater than our ability to comprehend what we're looking at. Right. So a doctor takes a look inside there and says, wow, I don't understand that. Abort! That's right. When they're playing God. That's right. God is at work in there. Yeah. He's doing something in there. Listen, if you're watching right now, I think we're streaming right mm-hmm. now, and if you're here right now, and you're pregnant, you've had that experience with the doctor who says, oh, you know, we don't like it. You know what? Let God be God. Mm-hmm. That's right. Yeah. Just let God be God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Amen. And, and all truth is God's truth. So those biblical truths are going to be confirmed in science Absolutely. because God is the author mm-hmm. of the universe. Yeah. And so my friend, Dr. Brent Bowles, pro-life OBGYN for 30 years, will say, if a doctor or OBGYN or physician tells you, woman, pregnant mother, that you need an abortion because of some problem, mm-hmm. go find a new doctor, someone who will love yeah. you both. And that's coming from an OBGYN who understands that abortion medically is not even the solution to these high-risk that's pregnancies. Right. These are people who signed a Hippocratic oath to do no harm, and they violate it the second they recommend and abortion in order to make themselves mm-hmm. feel better. Yeah. We're talking about the image of God today. Well, what do- God has declared sacred, we don't get to treat like trash. And it's politics mm-hmm. that has enabled a country to treat unborn children like trash, all while still silent shepherds say we're not political. Well, yeah, well, that politics is allowing the murder and womb lynchings of your lambs that you were created to protect, Pastor. And this is why politics matters, because they have consequences. And nowhere is that more true today than the issue of abortion. Mm-hmm. Cool. Okay. Um, and actually, for myself and, and Ashley, our second baby, Ames, oh, yeah. was a high risk. Um, well, I'm quoting high risk now because we got the fear of God put on us at 20 weeks, and it just ruined the whole rest of the pregnancy for us. The joy was taken from us. We got told that everything was wrong and to prepare ourselves, that, that you know, our, our baby boy is not going to come out normal. We were getting stress tests ever done every day. We were getting told we need to get that baby out, otherwise your baby might stop living. You know, that fear was in us. And so we, we pushed through and we, we had our baby boy, Ames, and he comes out just perfectly normal. And I'm like, Where, where's my disabled where's baby? Problem? This is... <laughs> yep. So, yeah, just to kind of affirm from a personal perspective on that, uh, I think it would be useful. You touched on it already, Pastor Jack, uh, in your previous answer. Um, I've been given the impression that um, there's, uh, ad- adoption is not a-, a good solution because there's just thousands and tens of thousands, tens of thousands of babies um, that nobody wants to adopt. And so I, I was told that adoption is not a very useful response to the abortion alternative. Um, is that a true narrative? What do I need to know on that? Yeah, so there's an adoption waiting list in this country of about a million families. Right. Now, the system is not perfect. It's far from perfect, and I understand that. And that's more true in the foster care system. My, my God, my Lord. Let's not even get started on that. But um, there's an adoption waiting list of about a million families in this country because there's not enough babies to go around because we abort them all. So yes, adoption is, is a beautiful solution, but you know who should be on the front lines of that? The church. Those who were adopted into an eternal family by a savior who was adopted by a father that was not his biological father. Yeah, I think adoption is close to the heart of God. And this is why I love my friends at Love Life, and they're here tonight. Go see them at the table afterwards. Their goal is to put a Christian witness outside every abortion clinic in the country with the hope of the gospel and the help of the local church in order to end abortion, end the orphan crisis. And you've heard the statistics before, right? It's something like this. If one family at every church in America were to adopt and foster, there would be no orphan and foster care needed because the Church of Jesus Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit, simply obeying that second greatest commandment to love neighbor could completely solve that problem. Yeah, what if, what, I don't even think it's that much. uh, You're probably up on the numbers more than me, but he just said, if every family in every church, that's a lot of families. One one family family. at one church, at each church. Oh, one family, okay, yeah, exactly. There's some, uh, there's something 380, thousand churches in America. Could you imagine? 
And what if we adopted the concept of, you know what, we're going to be a missions-minded church. Well, I want to have yeah. a baby. You really? Well, I can't. How many families do you know in, in your church where they can't, have, they can't have kids? Imagine if they took a missionary venture and they said, well, we can't get pregnant, so we're going to adopt a baby to the glory of God. We're going to dedicate this child like Hannah to the glory of the Lord. We're going to raise this baby in the Lord, and we're going to go for it. What if, even if that family couldn't afford it, what if the church stepped in and said, you know what, we're going to help you with that missionary venture. Mm-hmm. That's right. I believe that the church should be the driving force that when we say, you shouldn't have that abortion. You know, listen, this last week, we're so happy down home because for the first time, last Friday, for the first time, Planned Parenthood in Pomona, L.A. County in Pomona, Our church has been out there through the hard work of Seth and Love Life. They've been out there on the the sidewalk praying and speaking to anyone who will come up. The numbers have dropped so much that this last Friday for the first time, they didn't perform, they shut their doors on Friday because it was not lucrative for them this last Friday. Yep. What? What if the church had part of its budget that would say, if we're going to tell a young girl not to have the baby and she has, she has no means, come to our church or we're going to take you to the church. We're going to sign you up and we're going to take care of you. We're going to take mm-hmm. care of the medical. We're going to see this baby delivered all the way through. Listen, there are doctors and administrators, if not church budgets, that could totally take care of this. We just need to put our money where our mouth is, but we just got to get the mouths out there so we can put the money somewhere. Yes, that's right. Amen. God God cares about the orphan, and the Bible's very clear about that, right? Um, But you know why? It's because the child's life is endangered because his parents are dead. That's why an orphan's life is endangered. He doesn't have any parents. So if we're supposed to care about the orphan because his parents are dead, how much more should we care about the unborn child whose parents want him dead? Mm. So people say, oh, it doesn't talk about the unborn child in scripture. That is an orphan. That's an orphan whose parents want him dead. And we as the church simply have to show up where God already is and to trust him to move mightily, to shut down these doors of death with the hope of the gospel and the help of the local church and God's people on a united front saying not only, please don't kill this baby, we're here for you, but also we're going to give you anything and everything you need. And if you cannot mother this child, we will do it for you. But you want to know a beautiful truth when most women choose to go through and give life to that child under the impression that they're going to give it for adoption, they fall too in love with the child and they don't Mm -hmm. give it up for adoption. Now, sometimes that breaks the hearts of the family who wanted to adopt the child, but we do believe that every child deserves its mother and father. And so that's something to praise God You guys, I'm just blown away with what he just said, and he said it so fast. But... (laughs) No, but listen, this is totally profound. So the scripture tells us if we do not minister to the orphan, Mm -hmm. our faith really doesn't exist, right? Religion that our father accepts is pure and undefiled. It's, it's, yeah, and it's, it's fake. But you just said that what's worse than an orphan child, what's worse? What could be worse? Bible's top shelf. Mm -hmm. Take care of the orphan or your faith's not real. Then a child who is pre- as it were, in the heart of the parents to be orphaned so much so that we want it dead before it has the opportunity even to be orphaned is an infinite, infinite percentage worse. Mm-hmm. That number is yeah, yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. What a profound thought. Mm-hmm. And that is, that just adds fuel yeah. to what this whole night needs yeah. to accomplish. My goodness. Yeah, and I think as we close out tonight, not yet, later on, we will direct our thinking a little bit more strategically to love life and a few of the mobilizing mm. we can yeah. deploy people a little bit more effectively. Uh, we do want to go to a Q&A, and this evening is running out of time quickly, but I'll, I'll throw a few other questions uh, at you guys, and I'm probably opening a conversation right now that I doubt highly I'll get back from you both, uh, but I wanted to talk about the Equality Act and the implications of this, because that is a great attack. One minute? Yeah, just one minute each, uh, folks. Uh, 
So speak to some of those things, especially around um, the attack on women and the attack on the womb, because there's a lot to say about this. And we don't I'm going to say one thing, and then I'll let him have it. No, seriously. No, go. Num- number one thing. I fear that if this passes, I fear that it is God sending a message to the United States that is Ichabod. You know what that means? I I fear that if that happens, that God has left the building. That's just my personal conviction. This bill, listen, I'm so sorry, but honestly, tough. How in the world can not, how can a person support the Democrat party who engineered this bill, who literally hates God, they removed God from their platform, and yeah. put in false gods they boo of, him at their convention. Of, of Moloch. I'm dead serious. I'll stand out here tonight to midnight for you to defend that you're a Democrat because, because what? It is systematic and systemic evil. They have supermajority powers, and instead of doing something good, all they've done is used executive orders to undo what was good, listen, and then when they had a chance to do something, they crafted a bill from hell. It's as though Satan wrote it himself, and the Democrats are in support of it. Yeah. How dare So maybe, maybe you're here tonight and you're like, what are those weird guys talking about? <laughs> maybe, you're, maybe your friend pulled you with you or a family member and you're not politically woke and you're just kind of like, I just preach the gospel and I tell people Jesus loves them, mm-hmm. you know? And so I, maybe you're like, what is the equality? Like, that sounds super great. Because, you know, and, and packing the room tonight, there's probably some people who aren't as involved in the public square and in the political sphere as, as Jack and Morgan and I are. And that's fine. But we want to wake you up. We want you to be under, understanding to, so that you can function as watchmen to understand what's happening in these times. So I had a friend text me the other day, and I, I texted a group of friends that I went to college with, and I said, you guys got to pray against this bill. Someone responded and said, um, sorry, I can't roll with you on this one, boys. Um, I'm against anything that prevents discrimination against others for no reason. Now, the only reason I bring that up is just to sort of make the point that that's a lot of people. A lot of people are very susceptible to the euphemisms of the left. And, you know, euphemism is when you call, you know, slavery plantation care or something. It's it's when you call (laughs) murdering babies reproductive justice. Okay, these are euphemisms. Um... It's when you beat your wife and you call it spousal care. Um, very many people are susceptible to the euphemisms of the left, and because they won't do their own research and read the dang bill, they think that this is a good thing. So if that's you or you're not fully aware of what this is, we need to give you a brief overview of what this mm-hmm. is. We'll try to keep it short. Um, the, I, I firmly believe that if the Equality Act, the Equal Rights Amendment, which has been a pipe dream of the left since the 60s, by the way, go read Phyllis Schlafly's history against the ERA. Mm. Um, If this passes in America and becomes federal law, I believe that if we get to physical persecution of Christians in America, if and when that happens, I think that historians will look back and say that the ERA was a major turning point in what sped up the progression towards the physical persecution of Christians. Because it redefines reality, (laughs) which is what the left has been trying to do forever. Because the left doesn't believe in a human nature that holds across time and space. In short, they don't believe that human nature is fixed. We believe it's fixed. We're fallen. We're always going to suck. We're always going to sin. (laughs) It's just a matter of degree of how much we suck. And we need the blood of Jesus poured out on our behalf to be forgiven of sins and given the Holy Spirit in order to say no to sin and say yes to Christ. The left doesn't believe that human nature is fixed. They believe that it's endlessly malleable and that you can just tinker with human nature until you perfect it. And this is why they believe that politics is kind of just science. You hear political science, you hear that word? By the way, don't, don't get a major in political science at nearly any university. But it's, it's science, because science is supposed to be objective, right? Science is supposed to be about observing things and coming to understand physical, natural truths. Well, if politics is just science, then there's a science to the universe that if we get the formula right, we can perfect it and create true equality. 
This is what the Equal Rights Amendment aims to do. But of course, it's going to do so by targeting those who dissent and damning them for being a heretic of the leftist theocracy, because the left is a religion and they have very weird religious presuppositions and beliefs. So the Equality Act redefines reality. Here's an example. It includes protections for people based off of gender identity and sexual orientation. And it rewrites the Civil Rights Act, which we all say, praise God for. It rewrites the Civil Rights Act to include protections for people based off of gender identity and sexual orientation. So if those individuals have a natural right to live how they want to out of their gender identity, what does that mean in the public square? Well, it means that if a Christian college, or frankly a public one, doesn't allow a man who thinks he's a woman to compete in uh, female athletics, then that college will be shut down for discrimination. Now, the, the, the thing that people have common sense sees, isn't it discrimination against the women who can't get a college scholarship now because men are running against them? Exactly. Exactly. That's why it's a euphemism. It's discrimination pitched under anti-discrimination language. If, God forbid, one of Jack's employees or staff people at his church starts sleeping with men and saying, yeah, God loves gay sex, and he, Jack fires him because you violated the biblical standard for a sexual ethic and the guidelines of this church to serve here, Jack would be sued for discrimination because the government would treat that as morally equivalent for firing someone for being black. Wrongful termination. So this, this is what the Equality Act would do. Um, on the pro-life side, okay, it, it, it changes the definition of sex in the bill and in the Civil Rights Act to include the word pregnancy. So if you tell a woman who wants an abortion, I'm a pro-life um, OBGYN or I'm a Catholic, right? I can't perform abortions. I can't assist with it. It goes against my religious and moral beliefs. They've redefined sex to include the word pregnancy, so that's pregnancy discrimination. Now, can that woman go get an abortion somewhere else? Yeah, but the ERA would say, if you, as an individual, one person, a pro-life OBGYN says, I can't perform or assist with an abortion, pregnancy discrimination, and they'll treat that as morally equivalent for firing a woman because she's pregnant. So it redefines reality. And George Orwell predicted this mm -hmm. in his 1984 novel which you need to read if you have not read, because you need to get woke. The character Winston in that book says that in the end, the party would declare that two and two made five, and you would have to believe it. He goes on to say that it was inevitable that they should make this claim in the end. The philosophy of their worldview demanded it. Not merely the validity of experience, but the very existence of an external reality was tacitly denied by their philosophy. And he finishes with this line, the heresy of heresies was common sense because the big brother state had redefined reality itself. So it wasn't enough that Winston and the characters in 1984 were forced to say that two and two made five. You had to believe it. You have to believe it. And Joseph Goebbels, the mm. Nazi propagandist, said that if you tell a lie big enough, enough you, know. you can actually get people to believe it. How? by saying it over and over and over and over again. And so now we have woke pastors who claim to follow Jesus, who, are, who end up creating advocates for the enemy and functioning as what Michael Knowles calls court jesters in the kingdom of liberalism. They say, I dissent to this, I dissent to the ERA, but they don't do anything meaningful to stand against it. And this is what's coming down the pike for the church and for unborn children. So pro-life people will be forced to perform abortions, um, healthcare plans will be forced to include reimbursements for abortions in their healthcare plans as well. And virtually every state level pro life legislation will be eradicated under the new anti discrimination language of the ERA. So, this, what this, this is what this bill would mean for life and liberty writ large in the country. Mm -hmm. Culturally, it will, it will be the fulfillment in this nation of the French Revolution. It, the result's going right. to be the same. Right. If you're not familiar with the French Revolution, become familiar with it, because with, if this bill passes, uh, you're going to see that happen. That's right. And the assistant to the health secretary, who is a man who thinks he's a woman, by the name of Richard Levine, <laughs> no, who calls yeah. Do you guys know himself this? Rachel Levine, is a full-on advocate of the Equal Rights Amendment. Mm -hmm. And Rand Paul recently was questioning him 
and did a brilliant job. Now listen, I have compassion for these people. This is called gender dysphoria. Absolutely. This is a heartbreaking yep. um, condition to actually convince yourself and believe that you are the other gender. These people need our love, they need our care, they need help, they don't need affirmation. They don't need what Ben Shapiro calls mainstreaming delusion. But that's exactly what the ERA does. It mainstreams delusion and calls common sense heresies. And so he was very clear when asked if he supports genital mutilations of minors because little eight-year-old Timmy played with a doll one time. And so his teacher at his public high school said, oh my gosh, he's oh, a girl. Is, yeah. And this has happened. This, this is, is happening huge. in Canada. This is happening in European countries where the parents' wishes are being violated or directly going against the wishes of the parents because of child predators, and let's call them as such, mm -hmm. who are telling little boys that they're girls. And these kids are like eight. And then saying, well, you know what we really need to do? We just need to pump you full of hormone blockers and then cross-sex hormones and then chop off your genitalia and then reintroduce you in society under a different name. Mm -hmm. um, and genital mutilation has happened in many different countries. Um, and guess what? It's usually done volitionally. It's usually done with consent in order to go along with this, the cultural norm of genital mutilation. It's, it's, it's done under social affirmation and, and cultural norms. And Rand Paul questions Rachel Levine and, and he gives a mealy mouth leftist answer. The transgender medicine is a very complex field, um, Paul, Senator Rand Paul, and uh, I'd be happy to come by your office and explain it to you. It's not possible. And uh, John Stone Street, who's the um, yes. president of the Chuck Colson Center for Worldview, he did a great paraphrase of his mealy mouth answer on whether he supports genital mutilation, and here's how he sort of paraphrased his response. John Stone Street, friend of, our, of both of ours, said, the science is confirmed, the science is settled and I'll prove it to you by forcing you to comply. And that's exactly, exactly the goal of a leftist state, is to call delusion science and then force you to comply. Okay, we time, not on our side right now. Uh, we're gonna go to Q&A, uh, as, as you were talking about the Equality Act. Okay, so if you, let me ask you this, do you guys like math? I don't know what kind of question that is to ask. Um, if you take a dog and you count its tail as another leg, how many legs does a dog have? Four. Four. Just because you call it a leg, it doesn't make it true. <laughs> and that's what we're dealing with. That's how insane the Equality Act is, as we are just redefining science. And, you know, the liberals and the left are always, you know, pro-science and science. And then suddenly they just part ways with science when it comes to the biology and male and female. And that's what we're dealing with in this act. And it is, it is dangerous. It is insidious, and it's going to do an incredible damage to uh, America as we but know But don't it. worry, don't be political. Yeah. <laughs> so, hey, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to ask you guys one more question as people maybe, uh, if they want to line up and ask a question. So let me just give you some direction on uh, questions. Um, make your question uh, an actual question rather than your, a story or an opinion or a poem or whatever... <laughs> else you have prepared for this evening. Um, so ask your question and then uh, feel free to you know, head back to your seat. Uh, try to resist taking the microphone out of the guy's hands back there. Um, I lost control of these guys already tonight. I'm really trying not to lose control of <laughs> the microphones. So at this time, you're welcome to go stand up and uh, ask a question if you like. And um, we will answer as many questions as we can. We can't be here all night. We have to think about childcare, and, uh, and you know we've all got places to go. But as people are maybe, maybe lining up to ask questions, if anyone has any questions, if you don't, that's fine. Uh, I think what's important to touch on at this point, um, because we, we're hitting this topic pretty hard, and, and rightly so, but what do we need to know about the physical and emotional well-being or trauma that exists in a woman's life who has gone through this process? What insight do we need to understand about that as we try and do ministry and be a blessing and be a support? And with that answer, is there, can you truly experience complete healing yeah. from having an abortion? Yeah. So I'd love to hear your half on that. Yeah, yeah, good question. You know, there are many people on the left will respond to pro-lifers who say, don't get an abortion because you'll regret it. 
and it will ruin your life, and you'll be depressed, and you'll be more suicidal dependent, uh, you'll struggle with substance abuse, it'll be bad for you, you'll regret it. Um, Pro-lifers actually need to stay away from that kind of language, because abortion isn't wrong because women will regret it, <laughs> it's wrong because it kills a baby. But the left will respond and say, they'll take that bait that we, we give them, which we shouldn't, and then they'll say, well, look at this study over here that I just found that says that most women never regret their abortion. Because you always have to be wary of leftist studies. They're usually mm -hmm. focused on a very small sample size. They're not longitudinal. Um, they're very selectively applied, because this is, you have to make it scientific in order to convince the society that their positions are truly correct. <clears throat> but obviously, abortion is a deeply traumatic experience, because if we know that it's a human being, and we know that eternity's written on the heart of man, and God's reign falls on the just and the unjust, and even those who hate God and are defying him their whole lives have that still small voice or what we call a conscience that says something is going wrong here, something is wrong about this, then if we know that, the natural progression, the natural next step in that process would be you will be traumatized by an abortion because you're trying to defy reality. You're trying to convince yourself that the child is just property, that it's just a blob of tissue when it's clearly not. And most women actually, I think, know this at a self-evident level. And I know this because I work alongside many women in the pro-life movement. By the way, many women in the pro-life movement are post-abortive because they regret what they've done, they've been healed, and now they want to help where they used to hurt and hold a big warning sign out there saying, don't do what I did. Um, but you know, we've seen, according to 40 Days for Life, that, and I mentioned this this morning, that when abortion workers leave the industry because of the faithfulness of Christians praying outside of abortion clinics, um, those abortion, former abortion workers will tell 40 Days for Life, and I mean, they've been doing this for years, right? Is that, hey, you uh, Christians, when you were out there praying all the time, uh, I want to tell you now that I'm pro-life, uh, that we would see upwards of a 75% no-show for abortion appointments on the days that Christians were out there praying. <laughs> Amen. And we're going to get to uh, more later about how you can get involved in that fight. But, but my point is this, what does that tell you? It tells you that eternity is written on the heart of man. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because even a man or a woman who is at such a low point in their life, mm -hmm. and how do we know that? Because they've rationalized in their mind. They've actually rationalized paying a hitman to kill their child mm -hmm. and saying that it's just reproductive health care. Mm -hmm. But they have a still small voice that tells them, I don't want to be seen by others walking into that clinic. Why else would the presence of Christians result in massive decreases in the appointments for abortions? Because they don't want to be seen by others walking in. Why do they not want to be seen by others walking in? because of a still small voice, because they have a sense of shame associated with what they're doing. Eternity is written on the heart of man. Yeah. So yes, it is entirely natural that a woman would experience repercussions physically, emotionally, mm -hmm. psychologically from her abortion. I'm not gonna get into all the statistics of the increased likelihood of this and this and that. It's just common sense that this is going to ruin your life in a horrific way. But I believe, as I said this morning, if you weren't here this morning, that Jesus is just as eager to forgive the sin of abortion is any other sin. Because abortion is not a blacklist sin. And we are talking about something heinous. I'm not going to paint it over for you. Like if you are a man or a woman in here and, and you have played a role in an abortion, I, I, you just heard me say you paid a hitman to kill your child. Like I'm going to speak very clearly about it because I'm not gonna have anything to do with the leftist euphemisms of choice. We have to speak very clearly because our God is the God of the way, the truth, and the life, and we need to stand for truth. But King David is going around playing peeping Tom, checking out naked, showering women, then sleeping with them, then murdering their husbands. And he's in the hall of faith and was called a man after God's own heart. So listen, if there was hope for King David and grace for him, you know there's grace for you. All right, amen. I mean, this is the king of Israel who's literally a peeping Tom. So, and when the prophet Nathan confronts David, right? David briefly justifies his sin, as we kind of all have a tendency to do when it's thrown in our faith, and then he hits his knees in repentance. But there were still consequences to David's sin. God actually struck his child dead. And he said, my son will not return to me, but I will go to him. Yeah. So that means that your baby 
woman, and your baby man is seated on the lap of the king of the universe, waiting to welcome you into eternal glory. But that hope is only available in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I believe that God would want to heal your heart and use you to help where you used to hurt and create beauty out of your ashes. And so I partner with Love Life. We have curriculum. It's called Healing Hearts. We have lots of others we'll point you to. But there's curriculum for you that's gospel-centered that's going to walk you through a journey of healing. Because if you haven't come to terms with what you've done, you're not going to heal from what you've done. You have to look it in the face. But we want you on our team, and we love you, and we support you. And I want you to know that, that if Jesus were here bodily, he would tell you that he's just as eager to forgive you as he was King David. Oh, yeah. Okay, let's get to a Q&A. So Casey, go for it. Sorry, Casey's the guy holding the mic. No, sorry, just confused that poor lady over there. Thank you guys for being here. We're praying for you. Um, I'm a, a single mom, and the, for context, the last time my son was in school, I walked in, and his hair was in a ponytail, and his hair is very short. I pulled it out and said, Judah, no ponytails for him. So um, I'm in California, in Pittsburgh, which is close to Walnut Creek. I wanted some advice. Some of us homeschoolers are worried about them shutting us down, and I'm wondering, um, with this whole Equality Act and stuff, what your guys' insights are if they're going to be putting us in jail soon. I am For very, very determined that he's not going back into public school. What, yeah. what are your guys' thoughts? How do we prepare? Yeah, amen. Yeah, number one, it's, it's absolutely their agenda to do that. You, won't, well, you will not be able to flee to some other state like you have for other things. This is going to be, this can be a national law if it passes. And you can say, well, I, I can go to Idaho. I can go to Texas. I can go to Tennessee. No, because the federal government will put financial strongholds on those states. As strong as Texas is, they're, they're still part of the union. And this government knows how to manipulate for its power. Uh, homeschooling. In California, I don't know if you know this, but California hosts the largest homeschool population uh, in the nation. Think of that. It's a very powerful movement. But it's also been a longtime target. Oh, yeah. This administration, if, if God's grace doesn't inter intervene, uh, homeschooling is, is uh, numbered yep. nationally. It's a, it's a threat yep. to the public school pocketbook. And more importantly, public school agenda. Yeah, well, ideological indoctrination. Because, because leftism is a religion, which means that the dissenters of that religion are heretics. And if we're heretics and bigots, that means that we need to be rooted out and prevented from teaching our children biblical norms that stem from a Judeo-Christian worldview. So this fits within their larger sort of religious system. Two things. One, I don't think it's going to get through the Senate. Um, and this is thanks to the filibuster, but I could be wrong. We've seen wilder things happen, okay? <laughs> now, we have Joe Manchin and Kristen Sinema who are not going to vote to get rid of the filibuster, which means that the Equal Rights Amendment will have to get 60 votes. Um, and as you know, the Senate is split, with Kamala Harris being the tie-breaking vote. Um, I don't think even the more liberal Republican senators are going to vote for the ERA. I don't think Lisa Murkowski um, or... The two, uh, yeah, Susan Collins, the, the, the two ends of the country, the uh, Maine and Alaska uh, senators who regularly stop the conservative movement in the, in the back. Um, I don't even think they're going to pull the trigger on this, okay? I don't even think Mitt Romney's going to pull the trigger on this. Who, by the way, recently probably had the most shining point of his entire career um, when he looked Xavier Becerra in the face and said, you voted against a partial birth abortion ban in 2003 when you were in the Congress. What the heck is wrong with you? Everyone's against partial birth abortion. <laughs> I mean, Mitt Romney's brought one of the greatest squishes in the GOP. Probably a shining moment of his political career. I don't even think he's going to pull the trigger on the Equal Rights Amendment. So I don't think they're going to get 60 votes. But here's the point I want to make. If the church doesn't wake up and begin contending in the public square and putting our faith out there to promote righteousness and restrain evil, it is only a matter of time until something like the ERA will go through the House and the Senate and will be signed by a radical president until unless we wake up and start contending. Homeschooling, great. I was homeschooled through eighth grade. Then I went to public high school. Then I went to Westmont. Never send your children to Westmont, by the way. My gosh, some kooky <laughs> stuff going on up there. Uh, you can come talk to me about that afterwards if, if you'd like to hear more. Um, but the last thing is that if, if, if something like the ERA ever passes, um, that we have something called the Second Amendment. Maybe you're familiar with it. Families are not going to put up, Christian or not, by the way. I mean, there's a ton of super conservative pagans, right? who understand that, that liberty is important, they just forgot where it comes from and whose idea it is, who are not going to put up 
with federal agents showing up and saying, you don't get a homeschool, we're going to take your children away. That federal agent's going to get a bullet in the stomach. Now, I'm not, I'm not condoning that. I'm just saying many people in America are not going to put up with that, their children being taken away because we won't teach ERA ridiculous stuff. So just a couple things, maybe, for, for the woman who asked that to consider. Okay. <laughs> Okay, you ready, you ready, ready for another? Okay. Yep. Hi. Um, What's your so, name? Oh, my name's Ariana. Oh, that's my sister's name. Awesome. Great name. Um, I go to a private Christian school, and my two best friends have switched to online, and now I'm kind of stuck hanging out with these other two friends, I guess. And recently, one of these friends has been asking me every day, trying to get me to agree with his points in certain circumstances on homosexuality and things like Biden being a great president. And I've been holding my ground, but now he's been asking me, what if you were raped and you became pregnant? Um, what would you do? And what if you were only nine years old and you became pregnant? Wouldn't you kill that baby? And I always said, no, because that baby does not deserve to die. But I was wondering, um, you've given some really good points tonight, but what would you say in this situation? Yeah, so the people who, um, tr who are pro-choice, they always paint like the worst picture you could ever imagine. It's, like, it's usually like a homeless nine-year-old whose parents were murdered and she hasn't changed clothes in forever, and she's just starting a period, and then she gets pregnant. It's like, where are these? I mean, like, yes, and some of these horrific circumstances do happen, but, but that, that's the point. They, they try to create the worst possible scenario to make us look like animals for holding our ground. So just be aware of that. And again, remember what I said earlier. When someone uses the rape objection, just ask them if they would join you in fighting to end 99% of all other abortions, and they'll say no. So they're just hiding behind rape victims to make themselves look compassionate. Um, but in, in the worst circumstance ever, where a nine-year-old starts puberty very early, and she starts her period, and she gets, someone rapes her, and she gets pregnant, if, if, her, if she will literally die because her body cannot physically handle pregnancy yet, um, even in the worst scenario you could possibly imagine, um, you would put her on bed rest, you would take care of her for as long as you can, and you would try to get the pregnancy to the furthest developed point that the baby could be delivered early. Um, at, at the furthest point that the baby could survive outside the womb, right? If, if going full-term pregnancy is going to kill this little nine-year-old. Um, if you can't do that, and usually you can, um, if you did have to... Um, induce early labor in order to save her life, it's still not an abortion because the intent in that circumstance would be to save her life and not kill the babies. So it's the same answer even in the radical sort of pictures that they're going to paint. Yeah. I want to encourage you. Uh, Paul told Timothy, guard what was committed to your trust. <laughs> Avoid profane and vain babblings and contradictions. Mm -hmm. You're never going to win your friend over. Yeah. They have an agenda. They're actually trying to win you over. Yeah. And the moment you plant your flag, they'll move on. Uh, just know that you're being evangelized, so to speak, right? By, they, they want you to be converted to their worldview. You're going to have to choose. The Bible says, do not answer a fool mm -hmm. in their folly. Yeah. <laughs> someone who's open, that's a different story. Yeah. Yeah. But for someone who just goes from one extreme argument to the next is a fool. And the Bible says, avoid them. Move on. Unless you have an infinite amount of time, which you don't, and what little time you do have, God owns it. So move on. Yeah. Avoid them. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a gotcha question. Yeah. yeah. You know, they're no just way. hiding behind something, uh, a, a reducto ad absurdum, they, they call it. They're making a straw man argument out of the abortion topic. And it's silly. And it's, not, it's disingenuous. And uh, it's, it's just a little trap to get yeah. you all caught up in it. And so I just yeah. agree with that. And, and the recent data, according to the Guttmacher Institute, Planned Parenthood Statistical Research <laughs> Branch, uh, reported that in 2007, the annual abortions that were performed because the woman was raped was yeah. half of a percent. Half. Mm -hmm. Not even one. So they're appealing to the exception to argue for the norm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, Clark, what do we got over there? My name is Misty. Um, I have a question about social media. I know it's, um, it's a tool that could be used, but I have found it to be a little bit discouraging um, in any attempts to 
uh, elevate the sanctity of life, I have found um, most often uh, liberal Christians end up hijacking these sorts of attempts to do that. So my question is, how do you recommend, uh, it feels very divisive, and I feel like f for, the, for the most part, it's, it's the, the people that I'm you know, constantly ministering to in the unsaved world that have a far more positive response to that. It's the liberal Christians that, um, that make an attempt to hijack that. So how do you recommend um, handling that sort of thing? So social media is the new public square, so Christians need to be there because we have objective truth. We understand where objective truth comes from. I don't know why we wouldn't saturate those markets with good ideas to offset the ridiculous trash that's on there. How long will we be allowed to do so? I don't know. Um, by the way, like my Facebook, I don't even have 7,000 likes. And I was getting all these notifications of how many people were liking my page each month, but then I'd go look at the numbers and they kept going down. And I was like, that's so strange. So even someone like me who doesn't even have a large online platform, somehow my followers are just dwindling away. So eventually we're probably going to get to, get to the point to where any um, heresy of leftist theocracy is not going to be allowed on these platforms. And of course they say, you know, go build your own Twitter. Okay, we did. Now you can't be on our servers. Go build your own server. Uh, you can't be on, you know, you can't do that. Uh, go build your own government. Yeah, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to build our own government. Um, so. So I think we need to be on there as long as we can, but I'll actually piggyback off of Jack's point, which is that be aware of the conversations which are not helpful or not. Because, I mean, again, I've, I've, you know, I've been putting pro-life content out on social media since I was 17 on Facebook, and so I've been getting ripped you know, in half for you know, 12 years or something like that. And so I just have to be aware of which conversations are not worth having. And so you, you have to be wise, you have to be... Um, innocent as dove and wise as serpents and who, who it's worth engaging with. Um, if they're not a person of good faith who's interested in having a conversation in the pursuit of truth, um, then just don't talk to that person. And can, but continue to do what you do because minds are changed. And we get messages all the time of minds that are changed on abortion. Live Action, who has the biggest digital um, platform of anyone in the pro-life movement. They're the digital leader in the pro-life movement. They're saving babies on a weekly basis. Women who are, are messaging them saying, I chose life, mm -hmm. and then they're helping these women. So we need to be on there as long as we can, but just don't engage with people who are gonna be yeah. nasty with you. And frankly, we, we need to get to the point to where this type of liberal Christianity, whatever that means, um, needs to be treated as heresy, um, because typically these liberal Christians are pro-choice, or, ready, they're personally pro-life. Yeah. But they don't think it should be illegal. Um, well, guess what? There's lots of pro-slavery people who believe the same thing. One man's name was Stephen Douglas, the racist Democrat who ran against Abraham Lincoln in 1860. Did you know Stephen Douglas was personally opposed to slavery? I would never buy a human being and whip them like a cow, but I think it should be legal to buy human beings and whip them like cows. Uh, what? If you say that, your moral compass is broken, yeah. and I don't trust you on anything. Yeah. I would never beat my wife, but spousal abuse should be legal. This is the same thing when people say I'm personally pro-life because I think it kills a baby and I would never kill my baby, but other people should be able to kill their baby legally and we should fund it. Most liberal Christians are either pro-choice or they fit into that second category. They're personally pro-life, but they think it should remain legal. And this, this should start being treated as heresy. Um, and, and so you try to engage, right? And then when it goes nowhere, what do you do? What does Jesus say? Yeah. Shake your feet. Yeah, can I encourage you um, to think about the time that you spend on social media and maybe take 50% of that time. What if you were to take away from this weekend the commitment that I'm going to decrease my online involvement 50% and I'm going to take that time that I would have spent and I'm going to go and stand in front of Kaiser Permanente mm, yeah. or the local... Mm -hmm. Just stand there. You understand there? Mm -hmm. If you just stood on the public sidewalk and said, choose, li choose life. Think about it. That would be far more effective mm -hmm. than your time online. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Really. So you can't say, oh, gosh, Seth, loved what you said today. Just don't have the time to go to a, a place like that. You have the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You really do. Yeah, pull up your screen time on your iPhone yeah, yeah. and then look at it for the week and then apply yeah. that to saving babies outside abortion clinics. Yeah. And just to add as well, uh, don't under, when we talk about entering into that marketplace of ideas and conversation, 
and that interaction. Don't underestimate the power of the Holy Spirit that is working behind the scenes. Amen. You, you might play a significant role as just a couple of comments you make. And we play a role in the work that God's doing. And, that, and so you should enter into that space quite prayerfully as well, asking for wisdom, asking for God to have these divine appointments and to set up this interaction with somebody. Um, because if you are going to get into it, you know, and on social media, it might as well have some, be hopeful. It might as well have this potential to do something awesome in someone's life. Uh, I hate to say it, we have only time for one more question, um, and I feel bad for that, and I feel like everyone's resenting me for it, but uh, we've got to uh, wrap things up shortly, but yeah, you, last okay, question. It's Carolyn, and um, we heard how many abortion clinics we have in the United States. How many pregnancy centers do we have in California, and the Modesto one is right across the sidewalk from an abortion clinic? That's right. So according to Pregnancy Help News, there are almost twice as many pregnancy resources in this country as abortion clinics. Huh. And growing. And growing, that's right. So there, there are about 700 abortion clinics in the country, but there's, there's more places than that where you can get abortions. There's abortion providers, and you, maybe you're not aware of the difference between the language, but you can go get an abortion somewhere that's not strictly speaking an abortion clinic. Oh, yeah. Some hospitals perform them. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but there are about 700 abortion clinics, um, about 1,700 abortion providers in the country and between 2,300 and 3,000 pregnancy resource centers in the country. Um, and they're largely underfunded and understaffed because local churches won't help them keep their doors open for the same number of days that those abortion clinics are yep. open. I don't actually know the pregnancy resource center number in California. I'll have to look that up for, for you, but those are the national numbers. Um, so why wouldn't we be shutting down every abortion clinic in the country? And why wouldn't the church be flooding as much money or half as much money that they do to international missions as they do to domestic missions where mm -hmm. broken families are showing up who have arranged the death of their own children mm -hmm. at the only place in the country where we know innocent human beings are scheduled to die. Mm -hmm. I keynote banquets for pregnancy care clinics all around the country, and the, almost the number one recurring theme is, ah, if, we just, if we could just stay open another day. Right. If we could just get an ultrasound machine, what in the world is going on? Why aren't these churches tithing on a monthly basis to these pregnancy resource centers? And of course, Chino Hills and so many others do that, but we need to make sure that these clinics are open as many or more days than abortion clinics, mm -hmm. and that Christians have a Christian witness outside every clinic, fulfilling our second greatest commandment to love neighbor, and then when that mother chooses life, not only does she have the help, support, and emotional support of the local church, telling her the gospel and supporting her familially and with their community, but we also have all the medical infrastructure available to you to choose life. Listen, I know Morgan, we gotta wrap this up, and I know some are leaving. Hey, listen, real quick. You should share the goal. These people mm -hmm. may want to fulfill that goal. Uh, for t up to, uh, the goal that's, I think you're being liberal with time out to 2022. I think it should be done sooner. Amen. But share with them the, the aggressive agenda. Amen. That yeah, because I think something is going on in time and space. And I think we have to respond to that call of duty, as Winston Churchill said. And God's doing something in this country. Unfortunately, it took being told we didn't have the right to worship or gather for some churches to wake up. And some still haven't woken up to mm -hmm. that. But many are, and God's doing something. And if we don't get the right to life right, we're not going to get any other rights right. Mm -hmm. When a country murders its own children and innocent human beings, they're not going to get anything else right. If your moral compass is so skewed that you can call tearing the limbs off of a baby reproductive justice, I don't trust you to protect any other of, of my other natural liberties. So yes, we need to contend in the political sphere. But listen, brothers and sisters, we're not going to wait for the politics to save lives because these children are savable now. I just told you the numbers of people who don't show up for abortions when Christians are outside. Okay, so about two thirds of the abortion clinics, just clinics, not providers, clinics where we can stand outside of the sidewalk. Two thirds of the abortion clinics in the country are void of a consistent Christian witness offering the hope of Jesus and the help of the local church. What are we doing? 48 years of legalized abortion and over 63 million murdered unborn children. Being pro-life is not being political, quote unquote. There's a political aspect to it. It's just obeying Jesus when he says, love neighbor, 
hold back those staggering towards slaughter, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves and ensure justice for those being crushed. So I'm an ambassador for Love Life. Love Life is the best organization I know of in this sphere, in this lane. And that lane is to equip, raise up, and disciple you to do this, to end abortion in this country. And if we do that in California, I think that that righteousness is gonna spread across That's the right. country. Mm -hmm. Because California performs a truckload of abortions. We kill more babies in California every year than any other state in the country. Mm -hmm. um, I think 2017 was like 130,000 babies in one year in California. But you know, in prior years, it was like 200,000. If you look back at prior data, 2004, 2000s, around there, mm -hmm. 200,000 a year in California. So if we show up, everything changes because God is already there. He's convicting that woman's heart already, but he wants to use us in that journey of what he's already doing. Yeah. The impact of Love Life in Charlotte, North Carolina has been so powerful, that's where they started out of, that they have 150 church partners now. So when a mother chooses life, they throw her a baby shower, they get her a car, they get her diapers for a year, and they help her find an apartment because they have the financial backing and promise of support of 150 church partners. They have so many foot soldiers functioning as sidewalk counselors that they do have a Christian witness outside every abortion clinic in the area every day they perform abortions. They're saving families, and we should say families because it's not just the child. They're saving the whole family. They're saving multiple families every week and every month yeah. by simply being obedient to Christ. But it requires getting uncomfortable. Is it fun to get off and stop watching Netflix and go stand outside of a center that murders babies and plead with mothers as you're given the middle finger? and people roll down their windows and spit at you and say nasty things, which is gonna happen? No, that's not fun. But I want a comprehensive Christianity, not a compartmentalized Christianity. Mm -hmm. I want an uncomfortable Christianity because we're told by Paul that when we're weak, he's strong in us because we're just puppets that he slips his hand in through with the Holy Spirit to accomplish his purposes on this world. Mm -hmm. When we show up, everything changes because we're empowered by the Holy Spirit. This is what we're bringing to California. And guess what was the first West Coast church partner for Love Life? Calvary Chapel, Chino Hills. <laughs> By the way, this man right here is probably the most pro-life pastor in the entire United States of America. And he has been contending for life far before I was even born. And, and God blessed me with his friendship and connection. It's true. Because, no, seriously. Because I try to work with pastors and churches and, I, and I'm told, Seth, we don't say that because we don't want to offend post abortive men and women and we're not political. Enter Jack Hibbs, <clears throat> enter Rob McCoy, enter Morgan Lawrence, enter pastor after pastor who's being obedient on this issue. So it's time for us to join these men who have been contending for life for a long time and begin learning from them and begin putting our faith into the public square. We can save these children if we act. So listen, if you want to get involved with this, go to lovelife.org forward slash America, lovelife.org forward slash America. You can also download their app, Love Life USA, Love Life USA on Android or iPhone, click the connect tab, and then click the ministry area you're, you're interested in getting involved in, and there are five. Sidewalk counseling, saving these babies, putting a Christian witness outside there. Post-abortion healing, mm. getting them healed up, men and women to then be involved, to mentor others or to sidewalk counsel. Orphan foster care, yeah? Um, prayer ministry, so prayer walks around here praying around these centers for them to shut down, spiritual warfare. That's powerful. And uh, lastly, mentor families. So when a m mom and dad choose life, income and assigned neighbor. It's kind of like you assign, uh, signing up to love a neighbor. <laughs> and you mentor this family and you love on them and you have them over for dinner and you befriend them and you show them the love of Christ. Mm -hmm. This is what love life does. We're not waiting for the politics to save children because if we save this and we turn from this as a country, as Jack Hibb once said, it may be that God has mercy on this country. We want to give God a reason to show California mercy. Right. Amen? And that is more true on the issue of abortion than any other. So we already have 10 full-time Love Life missionaries in California. And what they do is they build partner churches up and they rally foot soldiers to serve in one of those five ministry areas. This is just the church being the hands and feet of Jesus. Shocker. And seven of those 10, ready for this? Seven of those 10 full-time Love Life missionaries, guess what church they come from? Because when pastors stand and are obedient to God, everything changes. I just joined Godspeak Calvary Chapel upon the invitation of Rob McCoy for my family and I to move up there. We had 130 people at the pro-life informational meeting on Friday, two nights ago at Godspeak. About 1,500 people come through there on a Sunday. 130 came to an optional event on a Friday night to talk about ripping babies apart. 
That's amazing. Most large churches would not get 10 people out there. So something is happening, and it's time for us to get involved so that we can stand before God and not just hear, well done, my good and faithful servant, but also be able to say, I did everything I could Mm -hmm. to end the genocide of your children that were being knit together and saving them from the womb lynchings that was federally legalized and that we were forced to fund. And I stood in the gap on behalf of these children. Listen, they go to heaven, but God's plan for for that child has been spoiled by Satan. It's time for us to wake up and end this. So there's a love life table in the back. These are your marching orders. You're supposed to be uncomfortable right now because you're supposed to be bothered by abortion until you do something about it. So we love you. We support you. Go see the table. Download Love Life USA or go to lovelife.org forward slash America. And I will go speak at any church in this country in order to wake them up on abortion and implement a game plan in order to do this. Here's our goal. End of 2022 at least 100 full-time Love Life missionaries in California. That's the numbers from my buddies at Love Life who have said that if we got that, we could rally a Christian witness outside every abortion clinic in the state of California. I say, I say we double that. There should be 200 by that time. And I'm, I'll be done with this co- final statement. Your, your Christianity, you need to take your pulse. Mm-hmm. If it's boring, something's wrong. Honestly. Ministry... You watch pastors and Christian workers, you see their joy and their excitement, and you wonder, wow, you know what, I wonder why my Christianity is so boring. I I would just ask you to consider this. Why don't you take this challenge for 30 days? You know what, think about it. For 30 days, make yourself available to this cause and see what God does in your life. If at the end of 30 days, you have not been thrilled blown away and have seen miracles and watched people's lives change. If, you, if that doesn't happen, then you know what? Go on a cruise after 30 days. But I promise you, one of the I, pastors get beat up. Seth gets beat up all the time. You know why we smile and get right back in it the next day? Is because what God does through us is so exciting and thrilling to watch that the criticism and the attacks are nothing. Amen. It's nothing compared to seeing God move, and Morgan mentioned the power of the Holy Spirit, why would God, the Holy Spirit, give you any power to stay in your couch? If you decide to get up and go, he's going to give you power. So please try a 30-day offer, money-back guarantee, (laughs) see what happens. Amen. So fill out a card on your way out or lovelife.org forward slash America and fill out the interest form on the bottom or Love Life USA app connect, click the ministry area you're interested in. Okay, so church, um, yeah, pa- Pastor Jack and Seth, have, they've, said, they've said a lot tonight, a lot to think about, there's a lot of information, and I hope you feel just a little bit more equipped to a- engage this fight. Uh, tonight will be on the church website, so, and this morning as well, if you missed this morning, you do need to go listen to that. Uh, oh, by the way, let me add one other thing. Of course. Because, <laughs> because I, I want you to also... I want you to be a pro-life ninja in conversations on abortion, where you're just flipping around, demolishing every demonic argument for abortion, because we fire hosed you tonight, and so I want you to act, but I also don't want you to be so overwhelmed with the information that you're trying to remember, what did he say on that one thing? So subscribe to my podcast, Unaborted with Seth Gruber, uh, because we're all unaborted, Uh, and as Ronald Reagan once said, I've noticed everyone who's for abortion has already been born. Um, So there's a great irony to being pro-choice. But subscribe to Unaborted with Seth Gruber, iTunes, wherever you listen to podcasts, because I do an episode a week. I'm moving to two episodes a week soon, and it's all for you. And people who listen to it say, I'm I'm changing people's minds. I have the answers. I'm more effective. That's what it's for. It's it's, it's just pro-life discipleship for you. So please listen to that, because I want you to be more equipped. I want this kind of thing to happen every week. You're just listening, and like you're getting more and more equipped, okay? And then leave me a rating and review, because we want it to show up on the charts, because when people listen to other politically related content, that'll start showing up, um, and nobody wants to listen to pro-life podcasts. It's like, why would I listen to that? Um, and so we just want that to show up. So do that for, for me, but it's for you, really, um, because we're going to create an army, and tonight is day one. Okay. Good. Um, we're, yeah, so look, there's, uh, there's, a lot, there's a lot you can do, and you really don't want to leave here 
today, you know, nodding along, smiling, kind of feeling charged, leave and just kind of do nothing with this. So you need to participate. You need to pay into this. You need to be petitioning and voting. You need to get active. You need to get your hands dirty. And like Seth said, there's some, maybe some discomfort and some sacrifice that goes with it, but you need to step up. You don't have, this isn't an option. These weren't suggestions. These weren't just some hot tips from a couple of guys up here. This is straight from the heart of God. You need to save lives. And Love Life is an incredible way to do that. And as you know, we as a church, we su- uh, support the Modesto Pregnancy Center. Um, that is important to us. Now, listen, I said this this morning, and I, it would be remiss of me not to land this evening uh, on this note. Um, Again, if you are hurting, you have gone through this, you haven't fully, you haven't enjoyed the healing process of making that mistake of having an abortion. If, if that's you, well, first and foremost, um, you need to give your life to Christ. Amen. There's nothing worse than carrying in your life a decision of such consequence, and you're not right with God. If you're not walking with the Lord, if you have not given your life over to God, that's first and foremost you need to do that. And then secondly, one of the first things that God wants to do in your life is let you know that He loves you and He forgives you for what you did. And there's a healing process to be had. There's a journey to be had. And this evening, we're going to have some ladies over on this, your right-hand side over there. They have gone through this. They have gone through the, had abortions and gone through the healing process. God has forgiven them, healed them, restored their heart, and done an incredible work in their life. And it would be truly sad for you to be that person and to leave tonight without going over to one of those ladies and saying, I need you to pray for me. I need you to show me what the next step is. Maybe you're a, a man who has condoned or even pressured a woman to have an abortion. You need to go through your healing as well. God wants to forgive you for what you've done as well. And so as we continue to fight and to get entangled with this war, as we continue to push back, as we continue to not be bullied by the other side or or government or policy, the Equality Act, as we continue to lock horns, great, let's do that. Let's be outspoken. Let's be a loud voice. Yes, let's do it in love. Let's do it in grace. Let's be rational with it. Uh, let's fight for that victory. Let's, while we're doing that, we need to also remember that there are people that are hurting and suffering, and we need to know how to show love and counsel them through that. And they need to feel that. They need to feel your love and your grace equally to what they, how they feel your stance and your position. Amen. That disproportional, that imbalance is unbecoming because we need to be known by our love for one another, Amen. that love of Christ. Yeah. So as we rage against it, as we uh, do everything we can, as we get creative to try and abolish abortion in this country, may we do so with the love of Christ. Amen. Amen. And so please, I do ask that as you leave tonight, uh, visit the Love Life table. And uh, find and Morgan, out more. I, I made a mistake because I talked too long again. You were supposed to hear from the Modesto Pregnancy Center director. So can you do me a favor? Can you Google the Modesto Pregnancy Center? And can you set up a monthly donation to them if you're not already? Um, whatever you can do, whatever number you have in your head, if you're wondering what it should be, just go ahead and double that number. Uh, and that should be a safe amount. Um, and so go ahead and set up a monthly donation to the Modesto Pregnancy Center. If you have the means, um, make a one-time sacrificial gift as well, but become a monthly partner there. Um, these are the people on the front lines with women, looking them in the eyes when they decide either to kill their child mm-hmm. or to respond to the help of those who are on the front lines. And they have been laboring for so long yeah. while they have silent shepherds, not even giving them financial support, much less a stage to share what they do. Yeah. These people have been so faithful. So please go to the Modesto Pregnancy Center website, set up a monthly donation. Please do that um, as a favor to me and to them. Yeah. They, are a, they are a door across from the abortion center. So sometimes women walk into their center instead of the abortion clinic because they're not sure which is which. <laughs> okay. And there are eternal souls in the wombs of these women whose lives are being held in the balance. Support them if you have the means. 
I apologize for talking too long because we needed to hear from her. Go yeah. there, sign up as a volunteer, sign up with Love Life, and set up a monthly donation to them. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Awesome. Hey, listen, everybody, thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Seth, Pastor Jack, appreciate you guys. Love you guys. Wonderful having you guys here. And I'm going to close in prayer. And for those of you who have kids uh, in our child care, uh, they're probably at a loss of what to do with them at the moment. So please... <laughs> Um, make your way and uh, pick them up as soon as you can. Let's close in prayer. Well, Father God, we are just this small group of people in this part of the country that want to make a difference. Um, God, I, I pray it would be it's the sweetest thing to imagine that you're looking down at us and that you're proud of us and that you're smiling and you are blessed by the effort. And God, we just ask that would be usable. And God, I pray that you would empower us, give us wisdom, discernment. God, there are four uh, Planned Parenthoods that I'm aware of, two in Stockton, Modesto, Manteca. God, we'd like to see them be shut down. And so we'd like your help. Uh, we want to step up and step into the fight, and we ask God for your help to do that. Uh, Lord, I pray that... Maybe you'd forgive this, this nation for turning its back on you. But for us, for this church, for those of us that are here today, we look to you and we trust in you. And we offer ourselves as a living sacrifice to serve the, every little thing that you're trying to do in this country. And that includes saving lives. So God, we thank you for everything that you are doing in this church, and each and every one of us, and in this country. Thank you for this evening, and God, may we leave today feeling empowered, emboldened, and ready to fight. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you guys for tuning into that long-form discussion and Q&A with Pastor Jack and I. Would you share that episode with friends? Um, it, it, it's truly fascinating, the number of people who who are squishing for this Respect for Marriage Act, or protecting gay marriage and uh, federalizing it and calling it a uh, sacred right and a natural right so that, of course, any business owners who are Christians and don't want to bake gay cakes or photograph gay weddings can be sued uh, for discrimination lawsuits and potentially thrown in jail and fined for all their worth. The same thing was being said by squishy Christians and fake conservatives in 2021. The ERA, the Equality Act, it's not going to do those crazy things, right? Hey, I'm for anything that prevents discrimination against people for no reason. Where in reality, these pieces of legislation under the the veneer of euphemisms and fake compassion end up allowing for the very discrimination that these squishy pro-lifers and Christians say they want to stand against. It's just discrimination against Christians and people who stand against the leftist religion and its goal of remaking society in its own image. And so share this. Share this with your pastor. Share this with your your Christians who are still voting for Democrats or your non-Christian friends who love you and ask them, do you, do you think that we should be able to target Christians for standing against this? But listen, if we can't get marriage right, and if we can't get the family right, we won't get anything else right. And so child sacrifice and the killing of babies through abortion is the natural conclusion of the sexual liberation movement. If there is no such thing as a sacred marriage, if there is no such thing as a mother and father's right, if there is no such thing as a child's right to their mother and father, and we can redefine all of these fundamental institutions, then we can redefine human life itself and position ourselves as the high priests of secular humanism. All of these things go together, and so you need to share this in light of everything happening in California and across the country right now, and up in D.C. with this euphemistically titled Respect for Marriage Act that will end in the jailing and fining of Christians who simply want to run their businesses in accordance with their faith. I'm Seth Gruber, and this is Unaborted. <laughs>